Kumari and welcome to the Wisdom Exchange TV. The Wisdom Exchange is a resource to help African women to learn, lead, and succeed in life, business, and community. It is a form where women of all disciplines will be inspired from the achievements of African women in business, education, philanthropy, and politics. These are the women that are the change agents of Africa companies, country, continent, and communities. They will inspire us to stretch what we can be. New interviews and expert blogs will be updated weekly, so please do join us every Tuesday for a new interview. These are the women that are the leaders of today and will change the leaders of tomorrow. Hello, my name is Suzanne Stevens. And I'm the producer and founder of Wisdom Exchange TV. I'm also the founder of the United Excellence Foundation, which mission is to have inspire, develop women leaders for tomorrow. We focus very much on advocacy, leadership, and education. As an inspirational speaker, a living coach, and a business trainer, and the founder of the United Excellence Group of Initiatives, I have opportunities like this to interview wonderful women to inspire us and lead change. Today not only do we have a special guest, but a special segment. And this segment is called the Ripple Effect. The Ripple Effect segment is very much about women all over the world that have a passion and inspire us to change through their dreams. Most of Wisdom Exchange TV is very focused on African women educating African women. But with the ripple effect, we focus on women all over the world coming to Africa who want to make a change and impact women leaders as well as children. And today, that's who we have with us. It gives me great pleasure to introduce a fellow Canadian resident. But I think she would tell you, based on the number of places she lived all over the world, she is truly a citizen of the world. Our guest today is Hannah Howard. Hannah is the founder of the Hannah Howard Fund and a Canadian resident and started at Canadian Charity in 2007, which provides a place for kids who had no place. Hannah and her husband, Ted Horton, have created this grassroots project in the Lena slum in Nairobi, Kenya. The mission? It's to help realize the potential of Kenyan's vulnerable children. Kids who may not have had a healthy meal before school. Kids who have no place to sleep. Kids who may not have had a mama. Because of the Hannah Howard Fund, they have a place to go before school for food for the mind. A place after school to learn. A place which provides them hope and encourages them and their dreams. Although these accomplishments are very valuable, perhaps the most profound achievement is that Hannah Howard and her husband Ted Horton give these children care, life lessons, and hope that they do not need to live in the parameters of their circumstance. They take them in, they feed them, they educate them, care for them, and don't leave them until they're well on their way to university. Hannah is a self-proclaimed bulldozer. But what she leaves in her wake are kids with manners, aspirations, full stomachs, and a belief that they matter. With 130 students at her school, a more at the door, hoping they too could wear a colored t-shirt that tells them they belong to something so much bigger. Let's get to know the woman behind the project. And let's welcome Hannah. Thank you for joining us today. Pleasure to be here. Okay, so we're just gonna, you know, ask you some, some questions to get to know who you are and what led you here. Maybe I'll start actually with that question. You know, can you tell us why you felt you needed to start this project? Well, Suzanne, that's a question that I get asked often. <laughs> I bet. But I don't really have a straight answer because I never intended to, to start this project. The project, grabbed us. We had no intention of doing this. Ted and I were here on a sabbatical, on a holiday. We were escaping all our commitments in the first world and we wanted to sort of have a more carefree situation. But we arrived here 
And we got confronted with the situations and with the desperation and fate took us into the Lenana slum and that changed our life. We were confronted with these little kids that nobody was feeding, they were starving, they truly were starving, they were going to die if we didn't do anything for them. And when they started singing for us, Ted said, why are they so listless? And the guy next to us said, because I haven't been able to feed them for three days. So that's when he ran out and collected milk and bread and whatever he could in the slum. And that was the birth of the, sub of the project, because once you start feeding them, you cannot not feed them anymore. So that changed our life. We went back to Canada after our holiday. We left a whole bunch of money in a bank account, making sure that they could do it. Lucy, who is still with the project today, I made her responsible for the bank account, threatened her, bulldozed her, <laughs> <laughs> taught her how to do QuickBooks, and taught her how to do elementary accounting, and told her that if one bob was missing, I was never coming back here. So, not a bob missed. And six months later we came, the kids had, were healthier because we set that up. And from there it is what it is today. Well, you, you know, it's interesting. You say once you start feeding them, you can't stop. Not a person like me, okay. because now I know them. Mm -hmm. Now, and they immediately, I mean, they're very smart as kids, but they were tiny. They were two, three year old. They immediately started calling me Mama Hannah, and every time I showed up, a pet showed up in the slum, they were around us, hugging us. Just, they became my children very fast. There were 20 of them. And so within that week, the numbers grew to 60, and then we left. And then when we came back, then we asked, you're feeding them. Now you're feeding them, now they're healthy. Now what do you do? Mm -hmm. Well, if you're feeding them, you have to educate them, because other than that, you become part of the problem. So, that's where we are. And we forgot that the teenagers actually, you know, they become teenagers. The little kids are now, teenagers, a lot of them, the, the, the older ones. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, the program is becoming more and more <laughs> expensive and, you know, the problems are the same, like the same problems that you have with your own kids. Well, you know, it's interesting because a lot of times people come from the Western world and they do something and they do with the intention, you know, makes them feel good and everyone feels good. But one thing I know about your project, and I admire and respect about your project, is you take the kids in and you don't leave them. No, once they are with me, I can never, ever leave them. It's just impossible. So I'm caught. I'm doing this until the day I die. But, you know, the children are all with me. I have three-year-old now. So I'm not going to see those totally grown up. But, um, yeah, the point that you say is, it's a very interesting point because I, I see it in the slum. I have seen it. I've been doing this for five years now. Mm -hmm. There are lots of well-intentioned people that come here and want to do the same thing and really believe and really want to do it. <laughs> but after three months, <laughs> they never usually last more than three, six months. It's a very hard thing to do because Islam is a very harsh and very spiritless place. So in order to survive in that environment and try to make something grow, it takes a lot of, if I say it myself, strength. Mm -hmm. And you have to bulldoze. Because if you cannot bulldoze, if you cannot be tough, if you cannot say no, you are always on the defensive. People always want something from you. You are the ticket out of there and, you know, and then the hand out mentality of of Africa just becomes very apparent and it's very, very hard to fight that because everybody's story is true and every person that comes to you with this story in whatever way, whether it is the direct line or conniving line or they're trying to scam you, it's still a worthy story, it's still a story of desperation and it breaks my heart every time now because now I have to say no. Mm -hmm. I can't carry on taking people. And, and you can't. So how do you decide which people 
or kids do you take into the, the school? Well, up until now, I never decided. <laughs> they decided. This was, I'm still working with the 60 core, but I'm now at 130. So what started happening, Suzanne, and that is, you know, where, where your foundation, I, I find that very interesting because I'm now churning out kids at the topper, at the higher level. So, you know, the, where I want to get these kids is to that point that they can actually go into secondary, and not secondary, because we are already in secondary right, stream. Right. I have more kids in secondary now than I have in the little classes. Okay. So our program has totally changed, and it's way more expensive. But what I started discovering is that I had sort of equal numbers, even more girls, and then suddenly they started weeding out. And in the higher classes, when they started going to high school, what happening here? I only have boys. What's happening to the girls? So, oh, they're not coming, and they're just not disciplined enough, and this and that. So then I'll call them in, and I'll just turn into mother, and berate them, and scream at them, and blah, blah, blah. But then I realized it wasn't their fault as soon as an African girl in the slum environment, in that sort of hardcore environment, becomes a young teenager, they are pulled into the family to help. So all these babies that are being born, they become the mate. They become, so the mothers are holding them back, or the, the caregivers, because in most cases these girls don't have mothers, but even the mothers. So I started noticing that. So I just stomped into this slum, and I opened the door of the shack, and I said, okay, you come, you come, you're my girl, you're my girl, you're my girl. And I sent them to boarding school now, mm -hmm. to primary boarding school. But having said that, I also noticed that we weren't equal at the top. We had more boys. Mm -hmm. So that is when I did an intake. Mm -hmm. And I, <laughs> that was the hardest day of my life. Because the word went out, and before I knew, knew it, I had over a kilometer of mothers and caregivers or guardians with young girls with very good grades. And so then I, that is the only time I have done that. I took by grade, the top. I interviewed them and I tried to get the leaders. I tried to find the leaders and I have brought them in. And I did not like doing that at all. Why the leaders? Because we, without leaders, <laughs> we're not going to go anywhere. We need leaders, mm -hmm. both female and males. Mm -hmm. But I have a lot of male leaders, they are there, mm -hmm. right? Because the boys are always being pushed, right? By the mothers and by society, by the culture, by everything, right? Mm -hmm. They're always the first ones, mm -hmm. right? But the girls are being held back. So the leaders, I need leaders. I need women leaders. Without women leaders, we're not going to get anywhere. Now, to that point, you have, to my understanding, you have a woman that you are mentoring, an African woman mentoring to help run the school. Is that correct? Yeah. Well, we just, she's mentoring in a way, but actually she's hired manager. Okay. And what happened with that is that I started realizing the importance of the leadership aspect. Now, I, for the last five years until January, I'm it, mm -hmm. bulldozer, right? I, I am a leader by nature because I brought up as a leader. I grew up with a father who was very insistent about leadership qualities for his girls and his boys. I mean, there was only one son and three daughters. So we are all leaders in our way. You know, we're always leading, we're always doing something, because that's what he brought in. But, um, you know, I didn't see this here, and I couldn't really give it to the girls because I'm too busy with the nitty gritty. You know, mm -hmm. I have to make this thing up work. I have to make sure they have food and pay their tuition, do all of these things, and there are 130 of these kids. I'm also like a bit of a perfectionist, so it's, <laughs> it's hard to do everything. So. I realized that even though I'm telling them about uh, leadership all the time, I'm ruling as a dictator, mm -hmm. basically, which is what I have had to do. So it's a cross, not working very well. So and also I got exhausted, mm -hmm. and I, you know, I only live here six months, and then six months I go back to Canada to my other life and to fundraise, and. So, and Ted started pushing, and I started realizing that I needed to bring in 
You know, this is become this needs to become so sustainable. Yeah, absolutely. And the only way it can become sustainable is if I bring that woman that already thirty something that has succeeded, that has the education that I am trying to give to my girls, if I bring her in. Right? Mm -hmm. Because they're not it's not Mama Hannah saying, you know, like blah blah blah, in here, out here. You know, I'm just like a mother. I'm a mother to them. So we hired this young woman, she's 33 years old, Catherine. Um, she has three degrees, and just finished an MBA in strategic planning. And you know, she's, she is a role model because there are not too many of these women around, but there are some, they're starting to emerge. Yeah, the middle absolutely. class is emerging. Right. It's not apparent to everybody. Ted and I says, where? Ted says, where? And I said, Ted, look around. It is emerging, but very slowly. Yeah. And these women are the ones, and this Catherine has made a difference because, you know, I say, okay, here. Here are the girls. Girls, here is what I want you to become. And it's working. It's and, and, and kudos to you with the sustainability because there's only so long that you can do it. And, and not only that, you know, having an African lead, they see African success and they aspire to that rather than aspiring to something they will never be. Exactly. So. And I totally believe, believe in it. Totally and completely. And that is why I am not big into the volunteers coming over from the first world and I don't really go for it at all. Mm -hmm. I, I work with volunteers but they are all African volunteers. They are all locals. Like Lucy, mm -hmm. she was a, a girl that had nothing. She's only his high school barely, but she's now my, my, my bookkeeper, my accountant, you know, and, and yeah. I have brought her up, and she has amazing leadership yeah. qualities, and she keeps on telling me, I, but I might not be able, now Catherine is here, and she has all these degrees, so I said, I said, Lucy, I don't have any degrees, doesn't matter, you are a leader, you're a born leader, just carry on where you're doing, mm -hmm. where you're going, and you're going places, girl. Yeah, because leadership isn't taught in the education system, no. and, and you know it is to some degree, but really it is, it is. something that's inherent. And you know, I, I I just quickly have to share this with you because I, I, I do agree that volun volunteerism and a lot of these initiatives I have an opinion about similar yeah. to yourself. I'll never forget the first time I came to Kenya, and we were going to build a home, and instead we were told by another Westerner who is been here a long time, you're not building the home. You're going to pay Africans to build the home. And I said, you know, that is a huge lesson and you're absolutely right. Yeah. So we, we did an occasional hammer for posterity, yeah. but that was about the end yeah. of it. And we watched them build a school and, and you're right. And that is the way it has to yeah. be. So we are on the same wavelength there. Other than that, we're just taking away from them. So with that, what impact has the school had on you personally? You know what? The school per se, which we don't really have a school, we yeah. sent them out to other schools, schools except right for right. the tiny tots. We have an extensive extracurricular activity because the schooling system here needs a lot of help. But having said that, um, the impact, the biggest impact is these children make me humble. They absolutely humble me. These children come from backgrounds that we cannot even imagine. Things have happened to them <laughs> that are obscene. I mean, the drama, the trauma, everything that happens. Mm -hmm. And yet I plug them from the street, like from the refugee camps after the elections here. Mm -hmm. These girls, they lost their homes, they saw their parents killed, they lo saw their houses being burned. They possibly were involved in rape, but we don't dwell on any of that. They don't want to dwell on anything. I just pluck them, I bring them into my compound, and they move on. And three days later, they're playing ball, and they're laughing, and they're smiling, and they're hugging me, and they're saying, Mama Hannah, thank you. And I say, well, what are you saying thank you for? I said, I feel safe here. Safety is the biggest issue for all of these kids and food. Yes. <laughs> They're always talking about food, <laughs> yeah. you know? So this is humbling is, I think, one of the things that I have appreciated the most. So have you ever done anything 
Now, I call it a school because that's all yeah, I... Yeah, sure, it is a school. I, it, it, but it, I had a hard time, yeah. actually. I didn't know it is a school. Yeah, it's a place it's, of learning, but it's not a formal education. No. Is that correct? No. Okay. Yeah. So, um, is there anything in this project that you've done that you felt it just didn't work? No. <laughs> really, honestly. Yeah, please. Um, no, because, you know, it's... It's everything works. Anything here works. If you are constant, if you are there and you believe in it, the every, these kids want everything so badly. They're not critical about anything, right? They're not demanding. You know, I remember when we came with Ted and we brought this bag full of whatever, shoes and whatnot, and everybody starts taking things, right? And Ted says, oh, you can't have that. And I look at him, I say, why can't you? I say, those are girls' shoes. We don't think that way here. Yeah. It doesn't matter. Yeah. You know? But that's the kids, too. The kids, to your point. I mean, that's part of the reason I right. love Africa, too. It's right. all accepting. Right. But with that being said, or Kenya particularly, but that, that being said, I mean, you, you just can't set up a compound in a slum and not have circumstances, well, other people wondering what you're doing. Yeah. I mean, when we first arrived, we don't have a comp the compound as humble as it is. We only have had that since 2008. Okay. And I learned my lessons as well. I, I didn't intend to become an NGO, which is essentially what we are right now. No, not in, <laughs> I didn't even know the word. So I started helping the people that were there. But I sh soon realized that if I wanted to be successful, what happened is that everything that I did, after a year, because I'm a good builder and I'm a hands-on person, I put my hands in the dirt, I build things, I make things, that's the type of person I am. I'm not a, you know, a, a person that is sitting on the internet and, you know, I let my daughter do that. I'm the hands-on person, so I take a shack and I turn it into something and I start planting flowers around it, I, I start, you know, I, I just do things. But as soon as they saw that, and they saw the money that was coming in, which at the beginning was Ted and mine, because for the first two years mm -hmm. we financed this personally, um, suddenly we leave and we come back and they say, oh, but yeah, now we want the salary, because it's all based on the salary. And I'm just looking at the guy and saying, no, <laughs> I'm not doing this to pay you a salary. You're not my employee. I'm doing this with the kids. So then that that relationship suddenly, I said, no, it's fine. You do your thing, I do my thing. I, I don't need to be here. But then all the kids always came with me, right? And everybody's crying. They know he's not going to feed them anymore. Mm -hmm. So for the first two years, we were cooking in the middle of the slum on two stones. Mm -hmm. uh, there are photos there, me doing, clearing the pot and feeding the kids and doing this. Then we allied ourselves with the church, uh, one of these mm -hmm. hundred of thousands of churches, Pastor Margaret, who is still on the board now. I, I, I stay very friend with everybody. You can't afford enemies in the slum. But that became a problem too, because after all the renovations, they, they wanted my checkbook. And I'm not letting go. And I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, and there's obviously, there's a challenge setting these things up. But I still go back to my first question. But I'll change it. You know, why you? So what is it in your that's brought you to this point? Like, what did you do before now that brought you here? Basically what I did before, after I got married and left my, my home, did not prepare me for this mm -hmm. at all, mm -hmm. at all. My lifestyle and what we were doing was far removed from all of this. What prepared me for this and what always had been there and is who I am, were the forces of my childhood that shaped me. Because I grew up in a home. I grew up in Colombia, in South America. As a first welder, I, I was a very small child when we got there because my parents left and went after the war in 1952 to Colombia. And it was a coffee plantation. But my father being German, so I don't know, because German seems to do this a lot. I come across it. Um, you were socially responsible because you were 
the person. You were the landowner, you were the man, you know, so you had more than everybody else. So immediately a school was erected. All the kids of my father's workers went to school, primary. And then he picked and ch chose because NGOs and, and what is the word, philanthropy and social corporate responsibility, all those words that we like to coin now, that didn't exist. This was just, you did it because it was your responsibility to do it as a landowner, as a person of some means. So we, my father educated everybody. And then from there, he pulled you know, just it happened naturally. It wasn't a selection or anything like that. It, it became apparent who were the leaders, and those went to secondary, and some of them went to other school. And when I hear you now, as you introduced me, and I also have read it in your, in 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 the stuff you sent me to read, that word ripple effect, that is my father, and that is what I learned in my childhood. I go back now as a 60 year old woman back to Colombia and I see the ripple effect. This is a third generation. They still remember my dad. They have no idea who he is, Don Heriberto. And they still call me Niña Hane because that is what their grandparents called them. These are all people in the middle class now. Mm -hmm. There is one is a biologist, one is they are professional people there. You know, so they are, they are solid middle class, and some of them are just maybe clerks, secretaries, or something like that. But the ripple effect, those families that, that came out are not any more laborers. They are middle class, and my father played a role in that. Well, you also said that your father taught you leadership lessons. Sure. What are some of those leadership lessons that he, he imparted to you that you use now? Well. It's the same, it goes back to the ripple effect. First of all, he said, we were responsible. Mm -hmm. So as a five-year-old kid, I had responsibilities because I was luckier than those kids, mm -hmm. right? So we grew up with that concept, yeah. right? I mean, those little kids at home, at homework time and the plantation, all these little kids, especially the, the ones that he saw as promising, they all came and we'd have homework together. And we, as the more, we had to help them because we, of course, had advantages that they couldn't even dream of, right? Mm -hmm. So that was leadership right there. So from the age of five, six, seven, eight, I, as the eldest, I not only had to do it with my brothers and sisters, but I had to do it with all these other little kids, right? Yeah. The expectations were there. We were always put. And my father and my mother too, but my father was pivotal. He never told us what to do. He always made us come to the conclusion ourselves. Mm. And I think that in itself helped a lot. And sure. I do that with my kids, my personal, my, my own two kids when they were growing up. But I do it with my African kids now, right? So I'm always telling them, think out of the box. They don't know what the hell I mean, but they're starting to understand it. They're really starting. You know, and, and to your point, you know, you, having the responsibility, you know, is a, a huge one. Sometimes you, you have the responsibility, you have to live up to, to that responsibility. With that, did you ever feel that responsibility was somewhat of a burden and that you wish you didn't have it? Yes, of course. Recently? <laughs> All the time. <laughs> Since I am gay, high, yes. I'm feeling like, excuse me, why me? Right. You know? And I became very bossy. And as the eldest, of course, I'm a bossy person. I mean, that's what people say. But I sort of don't mind it. I achieve things. You know, it's funny. My husband and I uh, were, were chatting about, about you. And, and often, people that get the things done have to put some force into place. And a girlfriend gave me a t-shirt and said something along the women that make history, you know, they're not always the ones that are liked. And it's the reality of change agents sometimes have to push their weight around. And it's yeah. Yeah. it's just the way it is. And so we like to communicate and be effective, but sometimes to get be heard, right. you have to get on your chair and your table so someone and listens. Yes, dump your feet. Now, so, you know, we, we've had, uh, to my understanding, with the school, you're at a point where people are going to start to graduate in yeah, university. I'm already at the point. So, how do you, when you look at this project that you've created, how do you measure success of that? Well, 
I'm just starting to understand because I never have looked at anything like that. I don't really look at life like that. Right. Right. Okay. It just I go by the seat of my pants and things fall into my lap, and then you you just have to do them. Right. I'm not a person that runs away from responsibility. I embrace responsibility because that's how I was raised. So having said that, that creates a lot of trouble for me because sometimes I end up like where I am now, 130 kids I'm responsible for. And believe me not, that I have many sleepless nights. Especially now, because last year when I arrived, not this six months, but last six, the other six months, um, 2009, 2010, <laughs> I remember walking into the compound. Who are all these people? <laughs> Kids became teenagers, and there were all these hormones going around and all this change going around, right? And it freaked me out. I mean, it really, I started looking at it in a different way. And of course, we didn't plan it, right? So I'm very top heavy. So these teenagers coming out at a fast period. But I, you know, it's a very competitive system here. To get into high school mm. is practically impossible. But all my kids are coming out with the grades necessary to get into high school. Of course, it helps that I am there and push a little bit. They also know I'm going to pay the bill. And a lot of these kids, you know, it's a problem for tuition fees. But essentially, all the kids are made doing the grades. And now, in high school, because I, like I told you, I have over 50 in high school. And next year, I have 16 graduating in one year. Wow, I am scared. And most of them are B. B pluses A's. Mm. That's success. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That is definitely success. Yeah. So you obviously have a gift. Which, yeah, a gift. Do you, but do you know what it is? Or do you, like, you know, a lot of things are done by the city of your pet. So do you actually know what your gifts are? I think that my biggest gift is that no is not an answer for me. Right? And I keep on telling them, you know, you because they're getting soft sometimes, you know. They eat four meals a day now, and they, they are the rich kids of the slum. And really, they are in comparison. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I just won't let them, and I tell them, you have to, you know, you have to produce. If you don't produce, you don't. You know, and I try to instill self-esteem in them. So I guess I'm a very determined person. Mm -hmm. And... They are learning that from me. They, they know that no is not an option. You know, so being determined, no is not an option. So there's a concept I talk about is edginess. And what edginess is, is there a point in time or something that you had to do that made you uncomfortable or stretched your, your comfort level? Was there any time where you felt, you know, I'm uncomfortable doing this, but I need to do this in order to achieve my objective? Yeah. I think, and this is with the project alone, mm -hmm. right? Because it doesn't really go towards all the rest of my life. Because my life before that, especially um, my first marriage, was very comfortable. It mm. was very idyllic. It, and I didn't have to get out of my comfort zone that much. I didn't have to prove myself that much. Things happened and that was enough. It was great. Just being a mom to my two children was my job, and I loved it. Yeah. And I did it with gusto. I just spent. I went to every game. I followed my kids. I was Alexandra's and Anthony's mom. And mom. I loved it. So I didn't have to get out of my comfort zone. And I was a person everybody loved because, yeah, I didn't have to hone any hard edges. <laughs> There's no stress. <laughs> and be stressed. I never was stressed. So yes, having started this project, I did not factor that in and it has changed who I am because I'm not always the most liked person I leave that to Ted everybody loves Baba Ted <laughs> uh, I'm the person I have had to get out of my comfort zone I get out of my comfort zone every single day when I go there because I'm I have to be a very a harder or harsher person that I really would like to be Otherwise, you cannot survive there. And that is one of the reasons I hired uh, Catherine now. 
because now, now you know, I, I've created it. I've brought it to here, but I need to find myself the side again. I need to be the mother to these children, not the bulldozer, that, you know? And I'm too much of a bulldozer right now. So let Catherine be the bulldozer <laughs> and let me be my mother again. It, it, it's hard being the tough guy all the time. Yeah. You know, tough it's, woman in this case. Yeah. Um, it, it's a difficult role to play. Yeah, it's but very. And you know, tough, tough guy is what I have had to be in the last five years. And you lose your perspective because you don't know where, you know, poor Ted sometimes talk to me and before he even finish the sentence, I'm already... Well, see, and, and to, to that point, the toughest people are also the ones that feel it the most. Right. Any, is there any time throughout this process that you had to actually compromise your personal values? to achieve your objective? No. Not at all? No. Just this great. whole program has, is based on my values, the values that were instilled to me as my childhood. Uh, no, I'm not capable of compromising my values. It becomes very, and that's not a good thing all the time, but. Well, no, you know, staying in line with your values is, 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 is a good, if, good thing, but sometimes to get things done, we have to, change them. And these, these are the leaders of integrity, you know, which yeah. is, you stay true to them, which no, is wonderful. No, I can't. No, I just have to. I'm, I'm, I'm too straight. And honestly, I'm a very honest person with myself. So I can't bamboozle myself. So yeah. then it's very difficult to do anything else. So I'm a Taurus, so it's bad. <laughs> I'm this steer. I go for it. <laughs> so, so what's next for you? I think right now Ted and I are hoping to start um, cosechar, that is the word in Spanish, uh, when you, when the fruit trees uh, are oh. ripe to, to harvest. Harvest, okay. We yeah. are hoping to harvest and see our teenagers, our children, we call them our children, we think of them as our children, become the adults that we know they can be. Right? Be it that they are professional or be it that they are a welder or a carpenter. So that is our biggest uh, goal right now. So we are stepping back a little bit. As you probably know, Ted bought a plane. He's a pilot now. We are going to be doing some of the fun things we came to, to do at the begin <laughs> to begin with and we haven't done. I have right? a feeling you're going to get distracted again. Yeah. So that is where we are headed. Hopefully. <laughs> so it kind of leads into, you know, what's next. Given the chance, what would you love to do that you haven't done yet? I want to travel more. I want to go to the Kalahari. I want to go to Botswana. And I want to go to Gabon. I want to travel more with Ted and, and do that type of thing. I absolutely have promised that I will not get into another project. And if another project is going to happen at the la because this one cannot grow anymore it's, it's, mm -hmm. otherwise it will implode it's already too big if it is going to happen it's because they have succeeded and they start another one but it's not my function I have done my bit I planted this kernel and now it's time for them to make sure that it has healthy fruit so let's see what happens now I know you have a daughter and a son, right? Yeah. Okay. Now, I know your daughter's older, but let's just say she's 10 years old. What words of wisdom would you give to her now, knowing what you know? Always give. Give more than you get. Always give. Because that is the essence of everything. If you are a giver, everything opens. And that I learned from my father. And I have lived my life like that and I know it is true so give is there anything that you wish somebody told you when you were that age uh, I uh, no I I had a pretty a pretty comprehensive my father was a philosopher and he kept us all in in I mean he wasn't a philosopher like Yes. Yeah, but he he was a thinking man. He he thought. He was a very giving, a caring human being. So was my mom. 
but my mom was 20 years younger, so he treated us all like <laughs> we were these five kids. <laughs> so my mom, we all behaved the same way. And I married a man 20 years younger, older than me, and we were three kids, so I know how that works. But my dad, he gave us lessons that were very valuable because he really talked to us all the time. We had meals together and we had to express ourselves. And he, he made sure that our self-esteem was high and he taught us the difference between self-esteem and conceit. And it has, I think I have done the same for my kids because it's very close, self-esteem and conceit. But there is a big difference. So it's always important not to become conceited, right? right? And, 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 and confuse that with self-esteem. And I teach that to my African kids as well, mm -hmm. right? Okay. And that, that is a very, very important lesson. Yeah, that and was a big lesson. And I thank him every day for that lesson. Because I actually know when I'm stepping over the line. <laughs> it's fun sometimes, though. Is there anything that you would have changed? No, I love my life. I love the way it went. I'm very blessed. I had an amazing childhood. It wasn't always easy. There were financial problems, but then financial problems, it's only paper. Everything else was healthy. So, you know, then I had a perfect first marriage, I had lovely kids, and now I have a wonderful second marriage, and I love what I'm doing. I love the world my, my life started, and it's ending the same way it started. But I had to do that thing in the middle, which was bring up my kids with all my energy and my full head. I could not, if I would have been doing what I'm doing now and raising my kids, they wouldn't be the people that they are, because I wouldn't have been able to give them everything, and I gave them everything I had to give. It's hard to be all things to all people. Yeah, it's very difficult. For sure. Uh, so what words of wisdom, and we'll just, this is our final question, would you give to African women? I don't know. Wisdom. I don't really have much wisdom to impart. I go by the seat of my pants. But what I keep on telling my girls is think out of the box and make sure that you take the chances that come your way and, for goodness sake, become self-reliant. You cannot put yourself in the hands of other people, be it a, a, a guy, a man, or be it another woman. You have to be self-reliant. I think that's great words words of wisdom, and you do have lots of them. <laughs> Regardless of what you think, you do have lots of them. Thank you so much for joining us and imparting some great wisdom. And I think not only to African women, but to the Western women and men alike, when if they're coming to Africa, commit to what you start, because it is your responsibility. Commit what you start, and ultimately one thing, the people here, the African people, the African women, the African guys, the African people in general, yeah, no different to us first worlders. We are exactly the same. We want the same thing for our kids. We have the same insecurities. We are really, it's just an economic disparity. But other than that, we are the same. Thanks for that. I think that's a great way to, yeah. to end. I want to thank you so much. Hannah and Howard, and check out the Hannah Howard Fund at www.hannahowardfund.org, correct? Yeah. www.hannahowardfund.org. And uh, as you may have gathered, they're always looking for funding. So uh, yeah. by, by all means, there's 130 mouths to feed and help get through school. Tuition fees is what we really need now. <laughs> My name is Suzanne Stevens. And I've made a decision along with my husband, Michael Ginrich, who is also the producer of the show. We're traveling through Africa interviewing women to really inspire other women and other people for that matter, and women all over Africa. So if you know somebody that we should be interviewing who is a leader in their own right, a trailblazer, people that follow them, who have a message that is, is a really strong message, please email us at info 
at wisdomexchangetv.com and we'd be happy to reach out to that person and have a conversation uh, for an interview. As I said, Mike and I are traveling all over Africa, so we will come to you over the next year period of time. Also, sign up and subscribe to wisdomexchangetv.com and we'll let you know every week who's coming, uh, who we'll be interviewing, and just remind you that the interview is up. And it will keep you abreast to women all over Africa. Again, my name is Suzanne Stevens and I want to part a few words of wisdom to you. And that is have the courage to push your edge to your personal and professional potential because you're the one that can make the difference, just like our guest did today. Thank you.